Gosh, what a wonderful day. The sun is shining, the birds are singing. And now it's time to read some comments on YouTube. You look like every white guy that moves to Japan. <laughs> this guy's not a filmmaker. He's a mediocre YouTuber. Bro, your stomach like Mount Fuji now. <laughs> oh, I'm really looking forward to this Q&A. Yeah. So this month marks the incredible 10 year anniversary of the Abroad in Japan channel, a milestone I never thought I would hit. And I thought what better way to celebrate than doing a Q&A, given the last one was two years ago now. Answering questions you guys have sent in about life in Japan, culture, YouTube, whatever, uh, with personal stories and experiences of mine thrown in that I've never talked about. And so without further ado, let's dive in. Chris, if you could give a message to everyone in Japan right now, what would it be? And can it please be, open the country. I've got flights booked for early November. I think my message would be, let's open Japan. Uh, but I know what the Japanese government's message certainly is, and that is, shut up and drink more alcohol. That's official Japanese government policy as of this week in a desperate bid to improve the economy. The Japanese government is encouraging younger generations to actively drink more alcohol. In 1980, the Japanese government got 5% of its total revenue from tax on alcohol sales. Now, in 2020, that figure is just 1.7%. It's not just the trend that younger people are drinking less, it's also Japan's demographic time bomb. You know, the population is shrinking rapidly. So I can understand the concern to some extent, and it's really sad to think lots of great sake companies around the country are gonna go under as a result of this. Companies that have been there for hundreds of years in some cases. But I'll certainly be doing my part because today, without any degree of irony, the sponsor of this video is Tipsy with a box full of the finest sake in all of Japan. What a great way to celebrate 10 years. I think the biggest problem with sake is knowing where to start and where to find the best varieties. And Tipsy does it all for you, with a monthly subscription box delivering authentic Nihonshu from around the country straight to your door, along with a beautifully curated booklet and postcards explaining the story and origin of each and every variety. And my gift to you is $30 off your first box using the discount code Abroad in Japan 30. And what better way to enjoy that sake than from this Hinoki Wood Masu Cup? Has a wonderful scent, does Hinoki Wood. But Tipsy has over 50 varieties of sake ware on the website. So if you're looking for an individual product, use the discount code Abroad in Japan for 10% off. And we'll kick things off with this one here, Niwa no Uguisu, literally Garden of Nightingales. Uh, it comes from Fukuoka. It's a very light, easy to drink sake, and uh, I just love it. Wonderful, sweet, fragrant scent. Mm. Oh yes, very good indeed. Cookie says, Chris, was there any place in Japan that scared you too much to do a video on it? So over the years, we've been to some pretty eerie, messed up locations around Japan. For example, the abandoned shipyard with Connor and Natsuki last year, the abandoned island, Gunkanjima, an incredible place, never seen anywhere quite like it. And the abandoned love hotel, where we had to censor pretty much the entire interior just because there was so much disturbing shit in there. Over the last year, I've had this obsession with haikyo, literally abandoned buildings. Um, there's something both poignant and you know, eerie and uncomfortable about going in these places and seeing what nature can do to a building once it's left to its own devices. Going through these locations, it's almost like playing The Last of Us, but in real life. And there's one place I've always wanted to visit, but I think it could genuinely be a little bit too risky, to be honest. In the mountains of central Hokkaido, there's an abandoned school known as the Round School House. By virtue of the fact, that is round. But it was built about a century ago and abandoned in 1974 when the nearby mining town actually closed down and all the students left. And I mean, just look at the photo. That is not a building that you should probably set foot in anytime soon. And it's claimed to have a lot of paranormal activity. People always report seeing and hearing things. There's supposed to be some sort of poltergeist in there. But unusual phenomenon aside, I'm much more concerned about the fact that this location is right in the middle of bear territory. And not just any bear, the gigantic, terrifying Hokkaido brown bear that can rip a human to shreds. And whenever I look this place up online, there's always warnings saying, don't go here, you will be savaged by bears. You know, simply put, for that to happen, that would be unbearable. And <laughs> unbearable. Sorry, I couldn't resist. But bears combined with the sheer inaccessibility of the area kind of make it feel like it's just one risk not worth taking. And yet, funnily enough, in a few days time, 
It turns out I'm going to be about 10 kilometers from that school because I'm doing a cycle with Connor for about a week across Hokkaido. And one of the hotels we're scheduled to stay in is, yeah, 10 kilometers from it. And honestly, if Connor pisses me off, the idea of feeding him to the bears at an abandoned school becomes a very tempting prospect indeed. Right, next. Show us three photos you've never shown the internet before. Why does this sound so seedy and sadistic? But be careful what you wish for. Photo number one is Charlotte. Oh my God, look at that horrifying imagery. Worse than anything out of the mind of Stephen King. That's image number one. Image number two is some fantastic artwork I saw inside a toilet in Kyoto, warning people to lock the toilet door. Make sure you lock the door. Oh no. <laughs> I love this photo for two reasons. Number one, the expression. The expressions on their face, absolutely priceless. Captures the sheer horror of someone walking in on you while you're on the toilet. And number two, I just love the dramatic, oh no, it feels like, you know, I, I can't work out if that's kind of a, oh no, sarcastic, or if it's a full blown, oh no, oh my God, this is terrible. I should have locked the door. <laughs> I don't know, but I love that. It's quite a fun thing to see in the toilet. Makes me also wonder, do people just not lock the door in that toilet? I, what's going on there? And image number three is what it would look like if I had a child with Elon Musk. Oh my goodness. Not great, not terrible. Four out of 10. Could be a lot worse, to be fair. Happy 10 years, Chris. The production quality for the most recent Journey Across Japan episodes has been incredible. Have you ever thought of creating your own Netflix documentary or similar? Well, thank you very much for the kind words to you, Smelly Man Cheese. What a wonderful name. Um, but it is, in fact, my dream to produce uh, well, my own take on A Christmas Carol. Because I, I love Christmas, it's my favourite time of year, and I love the Christmas Carol, particularly the Muppets version. Should I dedicate the entirety of November to producing a Brawl in Japan's Christmas Carol? You decide, genuinely. I'd like to do it. Please give me an excuse to do it. But I think there's this assumption, because I do put a lot of effort into production quality on Abroad in Japan, that I want to be making stuff for Netflix or the BBC. And it's true, I do. I absolutely do. Please, please give me money. Please, let's go. But in all seriousness, I do like producing things on YouTube. I have complete creative control and an established audience. And it seems kind of weird to want to walk away from that and, and do something else. But the day might come, the day might come. But first things first, a Broad Japan Christmas Carol. Let's make it happen. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt it necessary to distance yourself from a certain aspect of Japanese culture or society, either due to personal beliefs and or just disagreeing with it? One of the most difficult aspects of learning Japanese and mastering the language is actually the mindset and the etiquette and the way you have to speak and act in public. For example, in Japan, people are very kind of overly positive. Everything has to be praised and there's a lot of superlatives used to sort of describe everything, right? Whether it's sugoi, or the most overused word in the Japanese language, sugoi, literally incredible or amazing. You hear it so many times on Japanese television or oishi, umai, like delicious, amazing, incredible. Every time you eat something, you have to sort of praise it blindly in front of other people. You have to sort of say, oh, it's incredible. It's this, it's that, it's the other. To the point that you don't know when someone truly believes what they're saying or thinking, right? And there's a better example of this than on Japanese television, which I've talked about previously. It's so goddamn boring because the presenters just sort of blindly praise everything they see. It's not like British TV, where people are inherently negative or critical, maybe to some extent too far. And for me personally, I find it really like actually painfully difficult to constantly be like, oh my God, it's amazing, sugoi, oishi, saiko, delicious, brilliant. Like all these superlatives, I just don't like doing it. And I find that really hard to do, but you have to do it. Otherwise you come off as kind of incredibly rude or crass. Um, if the chef goes, oh, you know, Chris San, Dorliska, how is it? How's this dish? I can't be like, oh, it's pretty good, but it needs more pepper. I'm fucking kill you because that's really rude. You have to be like, oh my God, it's better than fucking the last supper. It's the best thing I've ever had times 10 squared. Yes, please do it again in my mouth. Like you have to literally be like that. Like you might have seen a sketch I did a few years ago where I pretended to be like a Japanese YouTuber and it might come across as though I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. That is genuinely what a lot of Japanese YouTubers are like. I watched them to basically copy them for that sketch. Uh, here's an excerpt of that if you missed Mm. 
ん今までこんなうまいポテトチップス食べたことないすごいさすがカルビさすがカルビあーうまいぞこれ、うん、すごい It was incredibly painful to act like this. I can't do it. Chris, I've always been curious about the process behind your videos, especially the cinematography. They always turn out so gorgeous and breathtaking. So, my question is what's the thought process behind taking the perfect shot? Ah,、oh, yes, gorgeous and breathtaking indeed. <sighs> To be fair, it makes me slightly depressed to think the most cinematic video I've ever produced is just Connor on the roof of Sendai Station doing a silly Batman voice. The city's changing. It's not what it used to be. But I think a good image should be able to tell a story or set up an exposition in a way that words never could. And、uh, honestly, it's my favourite part of a video, trying to find that shot. For example, the opening shot of the Fukushima documentary starts with an abandoned pharmacy that's completely overgrown, and then it pans out slowly to reveal that it's sealed off due to contamination. And it's an ominous setup that basically sets the tone for the entire documentary. And some of the drone shots I'm most proud of in Hokkaido during winter, you can really get a sense of the isolation and remoteness of Japan's most northern point and the otherworldly nature of the landscape. But my general rule is to try and use as few shots as possible to tell a story. Not only that, but I have certain shots. Shots in mind before I start filming. The last two seasons of Journey Across Japan, before I even really knew what I was doing, I kind of envisioned the trailer, right, and what that would look like. For example, I knew I wanted to capture the sheer scale of the abandoned islands in Kyushu, and I was really proud of this shot pulling back to reveal what looks like a post apocalyptic city. I remember I took that shot. And I showed it to everyone that was there, like Natsuki and Joey, and they went, oh yeah. And I was like, no, look at the fucking shot, it's amazing, it's the best thing I've ever done. Nobody appreciates these things. So I had these shots in mind and went out of my way to sort of execute them during the shoot. And for me, it's the highlight of shooting a video. That's the bit that I enjoy the most. Is there a series or video you've always wanted to do but couldn't justify because of the YouTube algorithm? A Broad in a Pan, a cooking series where I go into the homes of friends and family and inadvertently burn down their kitchen while attempting to cook an omelette. Honestly, though, maybe 60% of my ideas go sort of in the bin just because I know they won't do very well on YouTube, which is a depressing fact and a depressing statistic. But, you know, sometimes I get criticised for the thumbnails and titles of A Broad in Japan videos, that they're a bit clickbaity, right? And, I, you know, I hate my thumbnails and titles more. Than probably anyone. I don't want to constantly be pulling an expression in my thumbnails that looks like I've just sat down on a pile of knives. And yet, that's the rules of the game. Like having that face, the wow face, like,、uh, that is what gets views. I don't know why the human eye gravitates to that. People click on it, that's the way the cookie crumbles. I haven't used that expression since 2002. Like, I hate the title of the most recent Abroad in Japan video. I rented a $3,000 private villa, blah, blah, blah. With that thumbnail, I hate all of that. In an ideal world, it would have been called Journey Across Japan Escape to Paradise Episode 2 or Day 2, right? Like you would on a TV series, right? But because every video lives and dies by the click through rate, you can't do that. You have to have those twatty, annoying clickbait titles. You have to constantly adapt to the YouTube algorithm. And that is kind of the reason I think Abroad in Japan is. Survived after 10 long years by constantly adapting to that algorithm. Chris, what's your plan to convince the Trash Taste Trio to make you their fourth official member? <laughs> the fourth official member, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna threaten them. I'm gonna threaten them with violence. Let's see what you have to say for yourself now. I can't do it, Chris. It can't be done, okay? Let me out of here. Let's see what you have to say after another 24 hours. <laughs> Congratulations on the 10 year milestone, Chris. What is a so planned?、Uh, well, well, simply put, it's a place where soap is made and, and manufactured to the highest of standards. And、uh, there's absolutely no reason to doubt that it is, in fact, anything else. Anything far more、uh, sinister than that.、Mm. Ken Watanabe has been your goal for many years, and since you accomplished it, what is your next big goal? You know, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but after I did the Ken Watanabe documentary, something I joked about and dreamed about doing for 10 years, I kind of had this sort of emptiness. I realised that I'd done something that I didn't think I'd ever be able to sort of do again, having that like, long term goal. And for a few months, I tried to work out what it was that I wanted to do. 
And then a few months ago, I got my health report, my Kinkle Shindan, which I revealed in a previous video, uh, results of which were nothing short of appalling and really quite bad. And that kind of kick-started the next few months of what I plan to do on Abroad in Japan, which is put physical and mental well-being at the absolute core of everything I do. Like, I do have lots of big goals that I want to do, but I'm not ready for them uh, because I don't feel I'm disciplined enough right now. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not happy with the state of my health. I'm tired of being the butt of many jokes, particularly my own fucking jokes and roasting myself. But I'm 32 years old, I'm worried I'm going to wake up tomorrow and be 40 and I'll have spent the entirety of my 30s being overweight, not healthy, not feeling great and not really pushing myself or doing anything good. And that's why I'm about to embark on four months of serious kind of physical challenges, starting next week with the 700 kilometer cycle across Hokkaido with Connor. Whether I'll succeed or not remains to be seen. But in the run up to that and some other challenges I've got lined up, I have been training pretty relentlessly over the last few weeks. And to prove I'm not bluffing, look, here's some footage of me actually training and looking like I'm doing something good. But if I survive the upcoming challenges, and some of them are pretty dangerous and dicey, uh, then I genuinely think I'll be able to take on anything next year and beyond that. And hopefully I can inspire a few of you guys to actually want to get fit along the way as well. But uh, if you want to see the full training montage that I just showed you, stick around to the end of the video and you can check it out there in its entirety. And witness me attempting to become the Karate Kid. How do you find time to moonlight on the UCLA men's basketball team? And this is precisely why I need to raise my game. It's pretty difficult doing this and also being on the UCLA men's basketball team. Uh, jokes aside, I genuinely thought this was me when I first saw it. I thought someone had photoshopped it. What a handsome young man he is. Have most Japanese citizens been more on the happy, sad, upset, or don't even care side regarding not seeing foreign travellers freely visiting and roaming their country for three years now? At this rate, our Japan trip in October might become a career trip. Crying awkwardly face. The Japanese attitude towards the absence of foreigners has been frighteningly ambivalent. Like most people really don't care or even notice. Like if you ask most people, they don't even know that foreign tourists aren't allowed here right now. Well, they kind of suspect they are because the Japanese media has sort of said, you can come here as a foreign tourist, albeit on essentially a North Korean style tour where you have to come in a group with a minder guiding you around a predetermined tour. And a tour that unsurprisingly hasn't been at all popular. I don't really know who the fuck would want to come on that. It seems like the worst way to enjoy and experience Japan. There's no discovery involved, right? Like imagine being on a tour group in Kyoto, beautiful city. Oh, I want to go and see that temple over there, the Kiyo Mizudera temple. No, no you can't. We've got to go to the predetermined salmon restaurant and eat the salmon that's been determined that you have to eat on the tour. Fuck, it sounds awful. Like recently, there's been some incredibly confusing news where you can actually come into Japan, I think from September, on a solo tour, but you have to book it through a travel agency. And again, you have to have a predetermined route that you're doing. And again, people don't want to do that. And it's just confusing, so people aren't going to come. But let's rewind a little bit. Why is Japan still closed after two very long years and the only G7 country to actually still be shut? And it really comes down to politics. 29% uh, of Japan's population are aged 65 or older. They are vulnerable, of course, to the virus. But beyond that, there's a bigger factor, and that is they are the people most likely to vote, and the current ruling party doesn't want to lose votes or popularity to that massive voter base. And the current government has been generally pretty popular for having this policy in place, keeping the country closed. And I think they know that the moment they open the country, they're going to lose a lot of that popularity. Uh, and that is the main reason. So initially it was out of caution and now it's more out of politics. Um, and then there's been a recent uptake in the number of COVID cases in Japan. So they kind of extended it even longer. But as I said, a lot of people don't know that foreign tourists aren't allowed into the country, apart from the hospitality industry, which has been absolutely battered beyond recognition the last two years. And I really feel for the small to medium enterprises around the country, like hotels, hostels, restaurants that have gone under as a result of this policy. And if you look at cities like Kyoto, which are actually going into bankruptcy at the moment because of the massive loss in revenue from foreign tourists, the people of Kyoto have a really kind of complex and strange relationship with foreign tourists. Like, like tourists bring in millions to the local economy every year. At the same time, the locals hate the fact that things get overcrowded. The buses are difficult to use. Restaurants are full. I can attest to the fact that I like Kyoto a lot more when there aren't many tourists. The last two years, I've been going there far more than I've ever gone before Japan was closed. 
and it's been really quite incredible, so I can understand it to some extent. And for me personally, it has changed my image on Japan, watching it adopt this sort of really tough isolationist policy over the last two and a half years. Like early on in the first year, people that were residents in Japan, but not citizens, uh, if we left Japan, we couldn't come back into the country, which I found just incomprehensibly ridiculous. And it alienated a lot of foreign residents that I know who kind of lived here and called Japan home all these years. And it can seem pretty unfair that Japanese tourists, Japanese citizens can travel the world, go wherever they want, but people aren't allowed to come here. Meanwhile, the Japanese economy's taken a nasty hit. The yen is at a record low at the moment, borderline worthless at this point. And again, what better time for people to come into the country, tourists, and spend billions of dollars and take advantage of that cheap yen. They could quickly turn things to their advantage. The good news is I do think there are some indications that Japan will fully reopen to tourists before the end of this year. Without the horrific guided tours being escorted around by minders, I think you'll be able to come here as an individual and explore the country freely. So fingers crossed, hold me to it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> A while ago on the podcast, you mentioned giving a class at Temple University in Tokyo. What was that experience like? So last year and about two, three years ago, I did a, a workshop on teaching YouTube, filmmaking stuff, things that I'm generally, I know what I'm talking about for once. You know, I, I kind of know what I'm doing generally with YouTube. And it was a lot of fun teaching that, right? But during that class, they took a photo of me teaching and now literally every single day I get maybe 20 to 30 messages from people saying, Chris, is this you in this photo? Is that you? I can't work it out. What are you doing teaching in a room? Yes, it is me. Yes, I do look kind of good in that photo. I actually quite like that photo, but I wish I didn't have to see it every single day, 30 times. At least in the photo, I do look fairly affable. And that's the main thing, right? My son is wanting to be a YouTuber. How would you recommend getting started? Uh, don't do it. Tell him to get a proper job. Fucking YouTubers making videos in their bedrooms. Disgusting. Disgraceful. Honestly, unless he really likes making videos or he's a raging narcissist, I'm not sure it's a good idea. Fortunately, I fit into both of those categories beforehand. But I think too many people fall in love with the idea of being an influencer, right? A good friend of mine who's a fantastic photographer, I asked him once, like, what is it you want to do? Where do you want to go from here? And he said that you want to become an influencer. And I fucking hate that. I hate the word influencer. I hate everything it stands for because it's kind of like you're overlooking the craft that goes behind it, right? Don't be an influencer. Be a filmmaker. Be a videographer. Be a photographer. Be an artist. Anything. Work on a skill set. Even C Dog VA is a good voice actor. Underneath it all. He's a good voice actor fundamentally. Take a passion in the craft first and foremost. You know, I get the appeal when you go on TikTok or Instagram and see these influencers splashing around on their private yachts. Lucky bastards, I hate them. But long before I did YouTube, you know, I used to make videos with my friends on my little camcorder, probably from the age of about 12. And by the age of 14, I'd self-taught myself how to edit. And so that was kind of where my trajectory began with filmmaking and YouTube. I never thought that I would make a living from it. And the first five years of doing it, I absolutely didn't. I had to subsidize it by working as a teacher and taking on jobs on the side, like working as a reasonably priced hitman. So I'd say tell your son to look beyond the idea of being a YouTuber per se, and focus on being a filmmaker, a commentator, a voice artist, anything, anything. And then using YouTube as the platform to sort of live out and channel that passion into something. Hopefully that makes sense. Good luck. And now it's time for Hate Mail of the Week. My favourite. Go fuck yourself. This man looks like the type of guy that can easily get scammed. I mean, look at his face. That's the end of that bit. Go fuck yourself. And lastly, Matthew says, I can never think of any questions to ask at times like these. What's a question you want to be asked, but never are? I suppose that will be my question. Well, Matthew, I would like to be asked questions about philosophy, life, death, existence, meaning. I never get asked any of these questions on any q and I've got 3,000 questions for this q and I looked through half of them probably, maybe more. Didn't see any, so that's a shame. And uh, well, I'm not gonna answer it now, out of spite. But thank you so much guys for watching. As always, as promised, I'm about to share my 80s 
fitness montage with you. Uh, check it out, just to prove that I, I am getting fit. I don't want a stomach like Mount Fiji. I'm gonna be working on that. And keep an eye out for the Hokkaido cycle with Connor coming out in the next few weeks on Abroad in Japan or live on his Twitch stream. Check it out. But for now, guys, as always, many thanks for watching. I'll see you right back here all over again next time on Abroad in Japan. Take it away, 1980s fitness montage. Oh, yeah.